in recent times, average gasoline prices here in the United States have declined greatly. Um, so, as of summer 2015, average gas prices in the U.S. were getting close to three dollars again. Okay, they reached 281 per gallon um, near the uh, summer solstice, <clears throat> northern hemisphere summer solstice of 2015, and stayed high um, much of the summer. And then, starting in the later summer, actually. And then continuing to the fall, into the winter of 2016, there was a great decrease. So by uh, February of 2016, average gas prices in the U.S. were down to 169 a gallon, okay? A significant decrease. And they went back up over the um, uh, late winter into the spring of 2016, but they still are uh, significantly lower than they had been. And we've had another decline in the past uh, few months. We'll talk about the reason for the great decline over the second half of 2015 in a bit. When we talk about oil production in the U.S., um, we can talk about peak oil, and that occurred in 1970. The uh, U.S. in 1970 was producing about three and a half gigabarrels of oil per year on the homeland. Okay, you see the dramatic increase starting from 1920 um, when the uh, U.S. oil production reached 0.5 gigabarrels per year to an increase by a factor of seven, which is 50 years later. And oil production in the U.S. remained fairly high in the 70s. Okay, and then starting. In the early 80s, you see the dramatic drop-off. By near 2010, um, in fact, even earlier than that, by the early 2000s, um, U.S. oil production had dipped below 2 gigabarrels per year, and by 2010, it was down to about half of what it was in 1970. But we talked about in recent years, U.S. oil production is rising again. Okay. Um, We'll be talking about this bell curve that's been f put forth by an um, uh, economic uh, expert, an expert on the ec economy concerning oil. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this more. So what you do see is that as U.S. oil production starts to, to decline, okay, in the 80s, imports went up. Okay, so one thing you see is a dramatic rise, it's really interesting, a dramatic rise in U.S. oil imports in the 70s, okay, starting in the 70s. Um, in 1970, U.S. was only importing point about, oh, one and a half million barrels per day, and by 1975, 1976, that value had risen to about six and a half bar uh, million barrels per day. Okay, and that was partly because of the sudden, um, the sudden decline in U.S. oil production over several years that had been un was unprecedented. Okay, you see something like that hadn't happened um, throughout the 20th century. Okay, sure there were like there were little decreases of maybe for a year or two, but not for several years like this. Okay, um, and there was a recovery. But then, in the, starting in the 80s, U.S. oil production continued to decline. As a result, imports have went up, okay? By the mid-2000s, the U.S. was importing over 10 million barrels of oil per day, which is more than our uh, peak oil production of about 9.5 million barrels per day in 1970. But you do see, starting in the late 2000s, continuing to the early 2010s, U.S. oil production on the rise again, and we'll talk about how um, in the recent years, U.S. oil production has been at its highest since the early 70s, which is um, good news in a way. So development of horizontal drilling and fracking methods, an application to unconventional oil reservoirs, has opened large amounts of resources uneconomic, previously uneconomic to produce. If it takes more than a barrel of oil to um, get a barrel of oil, Okay, it's just not worth it. It's, and so 
there were previous reserves that it just took too much energy to get. It just wasn't worth it. Whereas now, because of new uh, drilling and fracking methods, including this now horizontal drilling rather than just vertical drilling, um, along with precision, precision, there are now new areas to drill that are uh, economic to do so, and this has uh, helped oil production increase. There are new shale, shale, not shell, but shale and tight oil uh, reservoirs that we have tapped into in recent years. And we can see the rise, okay? So uh, um, in the late 80s, U.S. oil production was still about close to about 9,000 bar uh, barrels per day or 9 million barrels per day. And you see the decline, okay? In 2006 and then 2008, there were um, weeks when U.S. oil production was under 4 million barrels per day, you see here. And then you see, starting in about 2012, the rise. And by um, early to mid-2015, U.S. oil production had once again exceeded 9 million barrels per day. It highest um, since uh, 1970, or uh, 70 or 71. Um, in fact, for the week of June 5th, U.S. oil production had exceeded 9.6 million barrels per day, which was the most or the highest since 1970, okay? Um, but then you see the decline, okay? You see the, the start of a decline, and that has continued. By April of 2016, U.S. oil production had dipped below 9 million bar barrels per day. Um, and by... Um... July of this year, U.S. oil production had dipped below uh, 8.5 million barrels per day. And perhaps in a, just a couple months or so, um, a few months by later this year, U.S. oil production will probably drop dip back down below 8 million barrels per day. Okay, So, um, nice, nice uh, trend, okay? And this is part of the reason that gas prices were going down, okay, um, the, the rise in U.S. oil production, but this isn't um, going to be long-lasting. Uh, the evidence shows that, okay. Despite, you know, some new drilling methods, um, we, we really know where all the oil is. It's not like we didn't know where that, those previous, these, these previously econ uneconomic uh, spots were, okay. We knew they were there, and from the understanding of the uh, econ economists and uh, oil experts, um, U.S. oil production should ha continue a, a net decline back down um, in the coming years. Okay. Now, oil production is not only important um, for transportation, but for, po for society in general. Um, in the early 1800s, the world's population increased above one billion for the first time. And, um, since then it's just increased by, it's dramatically, okay, basically gone up by a fact, more than a factor of seven over the past couple hundred years. And we see that this has coincided with a rapid tr increase in oil production in the world, okay. In the later 1800s, um, the world still was not yet uh, producing 5 million barrels of oil per day. And by n now, it's close, it's above 25, close to 30 million barrels per day. So, um, oil production, this dramatic rise in oil production, has helped uh, increase the carrying capacity of the planet. Without this tr dramatic um, rise in, in world oil production, we would not be able to st sustain life at our current rate, okay? It's, it, well, this oil has made allowed us all these cars, planes. It's, it's allowed us to make so many products um, to satisfy the, a, uh, an earth with 7 billion people. Um, we talk about so many products being, being made from oil, from plastics to computers to perfume to toothpaste to stereos, okay? Um, 
and we are at, at uh, we are at a time when oh, we are either at it now or it's just past or it will be in the near future where world oil production will peak okay in uh, the long emergency a book that talks about the uh, coming crises in the world due to uh, declining oil supplies Kunstler predicted world oil production would peak between 2000 and 2008 and this plot shows world oil production observed values up to uh, about 2012 2011 with a projection afterward okay um the uh oil expert uh oil production expert hubbard correctly predicted the u.s peak in uh oil production several decades prior to it the 1970 peak and uh predicted that bell-shaped curve and we're at a time where world oil production should begin declining we're not going to know for um, several years until afterward when we see a decline okay there's a kind of a going to be a bumpy plateau and it's 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 not going to be immediate where we can tell we've peaked um but a it's it's either just past or it's around now or it could be in the very near future. That's what uh, the overwhelming majority of experts on the oil production, world oil production, um, believe. So you see, in 2005, in 2006, global crude oil production getting up to around 70, close to 74, 75 um, million barrels per day. And for years now, and this continues until now, we've been kind of stuck on this uh, um, threshold in the low to mid 70s millions of barrels per day. Okay, it's continuing to today actually, and this was a um, this has been a significant difference from um, several decades, with the exception of this time here in the early 80s, um, several decades of uh, rise in oil production. More information about this concept of peak oil can be found on this website and by watching this uh, YouTube video. Um, just to review, once global peak oil is passed, half the oil ever available, about a trillion barrels, will have been extracted and consumed. And so there will be a tri uh, trillion barrels left to get removed from underground and use. And production will enter terminal decline and cost will increase. Okay, once production starts declining and world population continues to increase, demand will it will be uh, exceeded by supply. Supply will exceed demand, and that will cause prices to go up. Basic laws of economics. Um, so it is important to look into alternative fuel sources for the transportation sector, since 95% of its energy currently comes from petroleum or crude oil. Okay. And again, we talk about this. If current um, world world oil usage rates continue, we only have around 35 years of it left. Okay, and um, if anything, what world oil uh, usage rates have increased in the last several years because of uh, increasing population. So here we go. We are going to start discussing alternative fuels for transportation. Alternative to meaning to uh, those derived from oil like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. We will be mo mainly fit focusing on alternative fuels that apply to small to small vehicles, pe um, uh, cars, and small trucks. Okay. The USA Department of Energy has set a 30 by 30 goal, which means that 30 percent of uh, gasoline use will be from alternative fuels by 2030. This was put forth. Oh, about 10 years ago now. So, around 10 years ago, U.S. Department of Energy put forth this goal that says by 2030, 30% um, of the energy for transportation that currently comes from gasoline will be from alternative fuels. Okay? What are some alternative energy sources for transportation? Okay? Um, can you think of some? There is natural gas. You've probably seen, um, at least in real life, or seen pictures or heard about natural gas buses, 
we'll be talking about how uh, LA's transition from diesel to natural gas powered buses has greatly improved the uh, uh, air quality of the region and also saved the LA de uh, transportation uh, department money. Okay. Hydrogen. There's a lot of talk about this around oh, 10, 12 years ago, but it hasn't really taken off at some of the uh, projections. We'll be talking about many challenges associated with hydrogen. We'll be talking about both the benefits and the challenges of each of these. So you can sort through them, learn about them, and see which one you uh, think is most promising. Electric, okay? Tesla, right? We'll talk about Tesla is really revolutionizing the electric car because the, the new Teslas um, have such a high, much higher range than previous uh, new newly uh, debuted electric vehicles, okay? So we also have hybrids. Of course, um, the most common hybrid is the Prius. Nearly half of all U.S. hybrid sales since uh, about 97, 98 when the Prius debuted um, in the world have been uh, Prius models. Okay, but there's others too. Okay, there's we'll talk about, and we will be discussing biofuels, including biodiesel, which is basically a substitute for diesel, and ethanol, which can be used as a substitute. For gasoline and these biofuels are made from living materials as you might um, infer from the bio at the beginning of that word biofuel okay we'll be talking about them so let's start about with natural gas first on the list um, here is what natural gas burning might look like if say on your stove okay we even talk about natural gas can be used for heating at home space heating water heating okay cooking heating for cooking but it can also be used for transportation. Now, where does it come from? This is uh, somewhat a review, but a really good review. Natural gas can be extracted from oil wells. Um, once all the oil has been uh, removed, there can be natural gas left over. Coal beds, okay? So oil wells and coal beds can not only be used for those respective fossil fuels, but also to get natural gas. Uh, natural gas fields and landfills. Remember, landfills are one of the uh, major sources of methane, and of course, um, natural gas uh, is mainly methane. Now, now, natural gas is made of hydrocarbons, and it releases carbon dioxide like other fossil fuels, along with other greenhouse gases. Okay, natural gas is mostly methane, CH4, generally 70-90% methane, with smaller amounts of ethane, C2H6, usually 5-15% to ethane. So anywhere from around 75 to, um, uh, up to near 100% of the natural gas is going to be methane and ethane. There's very small percentage amounts of propane, C3H8, and C3H8, and butane, C4H10. Now, compared to gasoline, natural gas is considered clean burning for transportation for two major reasons. And you might remember these reasons um, from the last lecture when we were discussing natural gas. One, it produces fewer aerosols. It's better for air quality. To burn uh, amount of natural ga gas, the equivalent amount of natural gas to get the same energy as for uh, gasoline, the product made from oil, um, that quantity will produce 80 to 90 percent fewer aerosols. Okay, so it, so um, as as little as one tenth of the amount of pollution is going to be polluted to go say the same distance. Okay, and also, the same amount of natural the natural gas needed for the same amount of energy for tr for uh, transportation as gasoline will emit twelve percent less greenhouse gases. Okay, so it it's better for the air in two ways: less aerosols and less greenhouse gases. Okay, low density does present transport challenges. Okay, um, 
Carrying a sufficient amount of natural gas to power a vehicle any distance would require a very large storage tank. So natural gas is pressurized to several hundred atmospheres, about 136 to 245 atmospheres. And this is compressed natural gas, or CNG, still has a quarter or less of the energy content as gasoline, and hence it requires larger storage tanks at the fueling stations and the, on the vehicles themselves. Um, because of a larger volume needed compared to gasoline, refueling of uh, compressed natural gas vehicles is slower than refueling of liquid fuels. It can add double the time to fill the tank, actually. Um, keep in mind, natural gas is not gasoline. Uh, you know, you, you might think you, often you call gasoline gas for short. Or they, well, that's not the same as natural gas. The gasoline is a liquid derived from oil. Natural gas is actually a gas, okay, and not a liquid made of uh, meth, mainly methane and ethane, uh, smaller amounts of ethane and others. Um, on the plus side, natural gas costs less on the world market than gasoline or diesel fuels. Some countries like Argentina and Pakistan, or as Obama says, Pakistan, have greater reserves of natural gas than oil and have promoted its use. Conversion of engines from gasoline to compressed natural gas is straightforward. Uh, many urban areas in the U.S. have fueling stations. You might be wondering about how feasible this is in terms of fueling, right? Like. How many natural gas stations are there compared to gasoline stations? Okay, if I want to switch to natural gas, am I going to have access to the natural gas stations? Well, this is an issue, okay? Yes, urban areas, most urban areas have some. There are uh, three or four in San Jose. Um, there are three to four, actually four now, there's a newer one, four in San Jose. And they range in price, Two of the four are, are basically two dollars and forty-four cents uh, for the gasoline gallon equivalent. Okay, um, it's a lot different because gas, natural gas, is a uh, gas, so you have to put more in your vehicle. Okay, it's different. Um, you're not talking so much about gallons; you're talking more about cubic meters um regardless it's basically the equivalent if you're to compare to gasoline would be 244 gal uh two, 255 a gallon uh two, two of them are two okay so the most expensive one is 255 a gallon most expensive natural gas station in san jose is that price two of them are 244 a gallon there is one natural gas fueling station in san Ho that has a price of just 199 a gallon okay um, and so just for analogy, there are gas stations in San Jose, gasoline stations that are over $3 a gallon, okay? So you can have, see a significant savings. Um, it's an advantage. Now, how many for California? This is actually an older figure um, showing the locations of the compressed natural gas stations in California. Um, as of this t figure, there were around 100 or so clustered mainly um, in the Bay Area, in the LA area, in San Diego, with a few scattered through the valley, mainly the um, southern Sacramento Valley southward through the San Joaquin Valley, not so much in the northern San Joaquin, uh, Sacramento Valley. Okay, there's one here and looks like near Chico, but not in Redding. Uh, there's one in South Lake Tahoe. Okay, a few out in the desert in southeastern California. Now there are up about 200, we are up to about 200 uh, compressed natural gas stations in California. Just for analogy, there's a, perhaps 13,500 gasoline stations in California. Okay. Um, so there are issues. If you were driving, say, along 101 from... Marin County northward you, along the coast all the way up to Oregon and you're low on natural gas and you run out, you're going to have issues, okay, as you can see from this uh, figure. 
right? Same applies if you're driving in the valley into the uh, Siskiyou Mountains north of Redding. Um, or if you're driving through the Sierras, right, with the exception of, you know, the one station in Tahoe. Um, so you, you need to account for this, okay? Um, use of liquefied natural gas has generally been limited to long-distance transport of natural gas when the compressed natural gas pipelines are unavailable. For example, sh cargo ships can carry liquid, liquid or liquefied natural gas for transport across oceans. Natural gas requires temperatures of minus 184 to minus 274 Fahrenheit for condensation, um, depending on the relative proportions of the various hydrocarbons. So you see that basically the compressed of the natural gas, in order to turn into a liquid, it has to be chilled to extremely low temperatures. And that's why it's not yet that feasible to use liquefied natural gas. It would be nice if we could, because liquid has a much higher density than a gas. We wouldn't have to have as large of storage tanks. We'd be able to transport more of it quickly um, in pipes. But the challenges are that um, you have to chill it to extremely low temperatures and you need heavy insulation in the storage tanks to keep it that low or in the pipelines to keep it that low temperature, keep the uh, al li liquid natural gas from boiling and becoming uh, compressed natural gas. Low density does present transport challenges. Many of the U.S. pipelines are uh, near capacity. Okay. So this is an issue going forward as the U.S. continues to rely more on natural gas also for electricity generation in addition to transportation. Um, we have been talking about the uh, transition in L.A. from diesel to natural gas buses. Okay. There's the number 28 metro bus in LA okay there's a bicycle on the rack kind of cool that uh the uh digital um display is in orange and the number of the bus is 28 okay so maybe some giants influence even in LA 54 here are this number Sergio Romo and uh the bus looks kind of orange too okay along with the crosswalk sign so LA made the transition to natural gas buses and has seen significant benefits as a result. Okay. LA Metro has the largest fleet of uh, compressed natural gas buses in the country, nearly 2,200, about 2,200. And they purchased, the system purchased its first natural gas bus in 95, 21 years ago, and retired the last diesel bus in 2011. Okay. So it only took 16 years to go from no natural gas buses, pretty much all diesel buses, to no diesel buses, all natural gas buses. Um, and, LA, and the systems also saved money by converting. Nearly 20%, almost a fifth of all U.S. transit buses now run on natural gas. Okay. Um, by the way, they tried using the natural gas buses in San Francisco for Muni, but those buses struggled with the hills. So you see a lot of electric buses in San Francisco, same with Seattle. Um, so, you, so, but not yet so much natural gas buses. Those tend to be better on flatter surfaces. Now we've been talking about the buses. There are natural gas cars, okay? Honda Civic has a natural gas model. Um, it was, it's generally only been sold in uh, California, to my knowledge. Um, but it's a, nat it's a car, it's a ca small car that runs on natural gas, okay? And uh, there have been uh, others, okay? And some countries rely on it more than others. The three countries with the highest number of vehicles powered by natural gas in 2010 were Pakistan, Iran, and Argentina, okay? So a couple Middle Eastern countries and uh, a South American country. And so you look at this figure on the right, and you see that in 2010, 2.74 million vehicles in Pakistan were powered by natural gas, more than half of all that country's vehicles ran on natural gas, okay? So that's, it's, um, it's very uh, striking, okay? Because we know how in the world, 95% of the energy for transportation comes from oil. 
But here in Pakistan, nearly two in 2010, almost two thirds, two in every three vehicles are powered by natural gas. Okay, not a uh, product made from oil. Iran and Argentina both had nearly two million vehicles powered by natural gas. Um, 13 and 15 percent of their respective total. Uh, Brazil had 1.66 million vehicles powered by natural gas. If you look at this list, you see many countries in the uh, Middle East and in South America. In the U.S., U.S., different story than Pakistan, Iran, and Argentina. There were 110,000 vehicles powered by natural gas. Okay? And um, that's only one in every 2,500. Okay? Or, um... Point oh four percent. Okay, so there are around two hundred seventy-five million vehicles on the road in the U.S. as of two thousand ten. Kind of scaring early as many uh, vehicles as people, right? Okay, the number of natural gas vehicles has increased greatly for certain regions of the world in the past fifteen years. You'll notice for Asia Pacific. Um, dramatic increase, okay? In 2003, uh, less than a million vehicles in that region were powered by natural gas. And as of 2011, it was up to 9 million. Today, it might be close to 15 million, okay? You also see increases for Latin America, okay? Um, uh, starting uh, uh, in the uh, early 2000s and then slowing down in the later 2000s but continuing to increase. You also see um, a slow increase, although picking up in the late 2000s and the early 2010s increase in the number of vehicles powered by natural gas in uh, Europe. Not yet much takeoff in North America or Africa, okay? Almost no vehicles uh, in uh, North America or uh, Africa powered by natural gas, at least compared to the total number of vehicles on the road, okay? Now, you just need to keep in mind that natural gas is a cleaner alternative to petroleum in the sense that it's better for air quality and it um, burning of it to get the same amount of energy releases less greenhouse gases so it um, can help uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions but you need to know it's still a non-renewable resource right natural gas is a fossil fuel after all and it still releases to greenhouse gases upon combustion yes less but it still does, okay? It's still, when you burn it, it contributes to global warming. And although um, there is 200 times as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as methane, you gotta remember that methane is a very prevalent or potent greenhouse gas. Single molecule of methane has the effect of 25 molecules of carbon dioxide in terms of warming potential. Let's talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen. There was a 2003 State of the Union address um, by uh, W, okay? Um, and here he is in this picture, okay? And there's uh, the Vice President, uh, Dick Cheney, and the then, the then Speaker of the House, Dennis Haster. Um, might have heard about him in the news this year. Uh, kind of a controversial issue. Won't go into it. Um, I honestly thought about taking this fig this picture out after what happened to him what, or the news about him um but i was thinking and the the the, the, the the picture's been in the slides for several years and you can come to your own conclusions um might as well keep the picture in right nice to have pictures instead of just text so in the state of the union here's what uh, a quote from w a simple chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen Okay, so between hydrogen, the lightest element, and oxygen, the, the second most abundant el uh, element in the atmosphere, the one we need to breathe, right, generates energy, which can be used to power a car producing only water, not exhaust fumes. Okay, so uh, there's this simple chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen, which generates energy, and that energy can be used for a car, and it won't pollute. The car will only put out water. Okay, as a result of the reaction. And he goes on to say, with new national commitment, our scientists and engineers 
will overcome obstacles by taking these cars from the laboratory to the showroom so that the first car driven by a child born today, 2003, remember, could be powered by hydrogen and be pollution free. Well, sounds like a good I sounds like a um good, right? Uh sounds uh, promising. Okay, you got to give him uh, credit for that, right? But it turns out he, he was uh, too optimistic, okay? Technology has not progressed on this optimistic timeline. The book argues that 50 rather than, oh, about 15 years would be more of a um, better timeline. Uh, so, yeah, um, as of 2003, let's see, this is 2016, so basically we're, we're saying in a couple, two, a couple years from now or so, um, the, the, uh, the, the new the kids getting licenses for the first time will be able to drive these hydrogen vehicles. Not really, okay? There's been lots of challenges. We'll talk about them. So there's lots of challenges associated with hydrogen. This is, by the way, a concept car, the uh, Honda FCX Clarity there in the upper right. Here are some challenges. One, storage. Hydrogen has the lowest energy content per unit volume of any fuel, okay? Gasoline, diesel, natural gas, biofuel, of any of them, okay? And it makes sense because remember, hydrogen is the lightest element. So hydrogen is the lightest element. It has a very low density mass per volume and hence low energy per volume, all right? So that means you need to store a tremendous amount of it in a vehicle, which presents technical challenges, okay? How do you have a tank large enough to store this extremely light element, um, to match the energy content with natural gas, which remember, natural gas, compressed natural gas, still has about a quarter less energy per volume as deep gasoline, you need to compress hydrogen to an incredible 680 atmospheric pressures. Almost 700 times the, you need to pressurize it to 700 times the normal atmospheric pressure, okay? You have to put 700 times as much pressure on it as normal uh, at the bottom of the atmosphere. And under such intense pressures, hydrogen is such a small energetic molecule that it diffuses through most materials that line the walls of compressed uh, tanks, gas tanks, like compressed natural gas tanks. And once hydrogen penetrates the liners, it kind of seeps through, it can react with the wall minerals, wall materials, such as steel, aluminum and titanium and weaken them in a process called embrittlement. Now, light, there are some lightweight storage tanks that can withstand hydrogen, um, but they're very expensive. They have weird shapes, um, like round pegs and square holes that might not fit easily into vehicles, but they're very expensive. They can be thousands of dollars, okay? So an issue with hydrogen, it's so energetic so fast at that tremendous pressure that it just easily um, can seep through the materials lining the tanks and weaken the uh, material too. Now, we were talking about cost, okay? The storage tanks are expensive, um, along with other uh, things needed in, in the uh, hydrogen vehicle. The fuel cells require extremely expensive compounds. A fuel cell is used to uh, make the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to generate energy happen, okay? It starts the reaction. And many of the components of the fuel cell cost more than their weight in gold. For example, $70,000 just for the platinum, okay? Now this, these, uh, this figure is for, uh, several years old. This is from the book from 2010. In recent years, costs have gone down. Um, Costs have gone down, and there's talk about a potential hydrogen-powered vehicle being put on the market in the next few years with a cost of as low as $50,000, okay? Um, that might not sound that low to you, but that's very low compared to what it could have been um, five, six years ago, okay? But there are, it's, um, but we'll see. Uh, it, still, it is, the parts for a hydrogen vehicle are very expensive. Now. There are more challenges with hydrogen. 
reliability. The fuel cells are extremely sensitive to external or outside temperature and moisture. Okay, If a fuel cell floods with water, if it gets too much water in it, like in a heavy downpour, um, or when if the, the vehicle drives through like a flooded road, hydrogen will not reach the catalyst and the reaction will stop and then you won't be able to generate more ener any more energy to go to drive. If the cell has too little water, it's too dry, or the water freezes, gets too cold, or boils, gets too hot, the membrane will suffer damage and lose permeability and the fuel cell will overheat and the reaction won't happen. So to sustain operation, a fuel cell must be maintained under um, environmental conditions that are just right, okay, like Goldilocks, right? Not too wet, not too dry, not too cold, not too hot. Okay, so there's still debate, there's still questions about how these hydrogen vehicles would be able to handle um, atmospheric conditions, okay? Finally, perhaps, or actually likely, the largest challenge associated with hydrogen vehicles is production. You see, hydrogen is not an energy source, but an energy carrier. You can't get energy from the hydrogen itself. It, it's used to carry energy, but it's not a source of energy. Um, it turns out Earth has no recoverable deposits of hydrogen. You know, we were talking about those coal beds, those oil fields, those natural gas fields. It's not like that for hydrogen. You can't drill for hydrogen or frag for hydrogen. There's no recoverable deposits of hydrogen underground. In order to generate the hydrogen used to uh, power the cars, you need fossil fuels. Over 95%, 96% of hydrogen generated today derives from fossil fuels. Okay, 48% of hydrogen comes from natural gas, 30% comes from oil, 18% from coal. Now other means of production of making the hydrogen comprise an area of active research. Okay, So there's actually a lot of research being done on electrolysis. This is basically separating water, which we know it's H2O, the chemical formula H2O. It's separating water into hydrogen and oxygen and then being able to use that to generate energy. Because remember, the hydrogen fuel cell needs hydrogen and oxygen to generate energy. Okay. Now, you might be wondering, well, why isn't this done more, right? Why, or, or I've had students ask, could this be done in the vehicle? Well, the thing is... Um, Um, because hydrogen is so light, okay, it's such a low density, electrolysis of water is uh, is able to generate an extremely mo small amount of hydrogen, okay? You just, you wouldn't, you, you would have to have way too much water inside the vehicle with ongoing electrolysis to generate energy. Um, so that's part of the issue. You just, right now, we're not able to generate ver very significant amounts of hydrogen from electrolysis alone. But we're trying to learn ways to be able to generate more hydrogen from it. Okay, let's move on to another form of an alternative energy source, electricity. Okay. Electric vehicles contain electric motors that require only recharging, not refueling. Okay. You don't go to the gas station or the natural gas station or the diesel station to refuel. You go to the charging station to recharge okay and this could be a public charging station you're seeing you've seen them in downtown San Jose um, or this could be in your garage at home there are challenges with the electric vehicles including limited distance and speed now Tesla is revolutionizing the electric vehicle in the sense of distance prior to Tesla most electric vehicles had uh, ranges um, of around um, oh, 60 to 100 miles. The new Teslas can have ranges of over 200, close to 300 miles. 
Speed is another issue. Um, some of these electric vehicles have maximum speeds of 60 miles per hour, 70 miles per hour. Now, if you're a good, good law-abiding citizen and or you don't live along that route of state route 130 in Texas, this isn't a huge issue for you, right? Um, but um, this is one challenge for some people and also the, they take a while to accelerate. They're not very powerful. Now, the recharge times can be high. Um, it can take several hours to recharge. We'll talk more about this. But in general, if you want to have an electric vehicle, you want you really want to have a charging station at your home, you want a 240 volt outlet, not a 120 volt outlet. With a 240 volt outlet, it can take 8 to 20 hours to charge, completely charge the vehicle. Okay, and that's just not enough time at night, right? To have it recharged the next day. If you buy a 240 volt outlet, and some of you might already have those in your homes, you can cut that uh, charging time down to four to five hours, okay, which is very realistic when we talk about being able to charge up at night. Um, now, you have to also be careful, right? You really have to, to be uh, alert and make sure you charge at night. Um, you don't forget, right? Because what if you forget, you know, to plug in your vehicle at night and then you get up in the morning and, and you're getting ready to leave and then you find, oh, you're vehicle has no the battery's dead okay what are you going to do how are you going to get to work right what, or what excuse are you going to come up with for the boss or if you're going to school for the for the uh, professor okay i forgot to plug in my car last night um cost is an issue although cost is coming down um which is good as technology improves there is also the carbon footprint of the batteries okay takes emissions to make the batteries of these electric vehicles okay so there are indirect emissions associated with the electric vehicles and there's also um, disposal issues with the batteries now we talk about challenges but there's a lot of great benefits of electric vehicles they do not emit greenhouse gases directly okay they're very clean in the sense also they don't emit or release aerosols okay so directly when you drive the electric vehicle it's not going to pollute Right, the Tesla doesn't have a tailpipe. It's not going to be contributing to the greenhouse effect, right? You're not going to have while you're driving it. You're not going to have a direct carbon footprint from that, right? There's an indirect carbon footprint, but not a, really a direct one, which is great. Um, now there is, of course, um, there are fossil fuels used to make the electricity, right? But that's more indirect because while it's driving, it's not directly using emitting fossil fuels. It's using electricity which was made from fossil fuels, right, at coal and natural gas power plants. But one thing that's being done is um, trying to find clean electricity for the, for the electric vehicles. So hopefully in the future we can have these electric vehicles that run on solar power or they run on electricity made from solar panels, from wind turbines, from hydroelectric dams, from tide and wave power plants from geothermal power plants okay and also electric vehicle can save you money on gasoline right and when uh, gas prices you know increase if they continue to increase due to uh, the oil upcoming oil shortages in the world the uh, you know the people might switch more this to the electricity right it's a way to the electric vehicles you don't have to spend money on gasoline okay you spend some so you spend money to buy the electricity but hopefully it's uh it can, it's less expensive than the gasoline okay and you might also have to pay for some of these um public electric stations um there's also by the way there's uh other benefits too general electric vehicles allow one to travel in the carpool lane with only one person okay so you can save time on your commute each day you know leave the sleep a little more leave the house later not have to deal with stop and go traffic as much if you have an electric vehicle because you have that hov sticker so you can drive in the carpool lane here is the tesla model s um this picture 
Three years old. This Tesla Model S debuted in June 2012, just over four years ago. This is a California model. Um, there are a couple major Tesla factories in the world. One is in Fremont, California. You've probably seen it when you've driven on uh, 880. Okay, it's in southern Fremont. Maybe you've had a friend um, who's worked there. Okay, I've had co-workers who have uh, worked there. Um, there's also a Tesla factory in Europe. And Tesla is, again, revolutionizing the electric vehicle. Global sales of the uh, Tesla Model S passed 100,000 recently. The Tesla Model S became the first electric car to top monthly sales in a country. In Norway, very environmental country, in both September and December of 2013. So in September and December of 2013, this was the top selling new car in the uh, Norway and it's already won numerous awards it was the 2013 motor trend car of the year it was the 2013 automobile magazine car of the year it was the 2013 world green car of the year as of June 2015 about 64 percent of total global sales are from the US um, so as of June last year almost two-thirds of all total worldwide sales have been from the US Okay, so that's a country where it's uh, been very popular. We can talk about price, range, and price per range of electric vehicles. Okay, so um, the price of these electric vehicles is given in blue below the name. So you see, we have a lot of different electric vehicles, not just, by the way, not just small, compact cars, but SUVs like the Toyota RAV4 EV, or EV stands for electric vehicle, um, sports cars like the Fiat 500e. So the, there, here are the prices, and you see the prices generally range from just over 20000 You can buy a Mitsubishi um, electric vehicle for uh, just under 23000 to oh fifty thousand for most of them, exception with this Tesla Model S. Um, now the Tesla Model S is close to eighty thousand, but there's a big advantage of it over the electric vehicles. So then, if you come down and look at the um, uh, the text in yellow below the price, you have range. Okay, and what you'll see is that, like I mentioned earlier, the electric range or excuse me, the, the range of the electric vehicles generally is from 60 to 100 miles, okay? But the, the Tesla Model S is an exception. The Tesla Model S has a range of 265 miles, okay? So that's, that's uh, why Tesla is revolutionizing the electric car. It has so much more range. And by the way, just because the range is a certain value doesn't mean you can go um, that total distance between charges. It's important to keep the battery between about a 10 to 90% range or a 20 to 80% range um, in order to improve the life. If you uh, let the battery go all the way down to zero, you use, all, you use all the battery, and then you charge all the way up to 100%, that can actually decrease the battery life. So it's important to... Um, actually not use the full range so the actual range of a vehicle that ha has an uh, advertised range of 80 miles might only be um, 60 miles and so range anxiety is a real um, real feeling for some people okay um, if you have any sort of a moderate to long commute th then you're gonna have issues with a lot of these electric vehicles for example, if you have a 40-mile um, commute uh, to work each day and a 40-mile commute back, it, okay, that's 80 miles, you know, th these electric vehicles aren't going to be able to cut it unless you charge up while you're at work, I guess. You could do that. Um, but Tesla is starting to make the electric vehicles more feasible for people. Um, now, like we mentioned earlier, you can... 
you can uh, decrease your recharge time dramatically by getting a 240 volt outlet. They start at around $600. Um, the 240 volt uh, charging stations do. And there's around $500 to $1,500 of labor to install, but it really pays off in the long run, decreased uh, recharge times. And for the, a lot of these newer electric vehicles, the top speed is 85 to 90 miles per hour, which should be fine to satisfy your needs, right? But the Tesla Model S can get up to 130 miles per hour. Okay, now we will be begin discussing um, price per range. Price per range. So that's what the blue bars are showing. How much does it cost to go basically to have one mile of range? And you see that for the BMW i3 electric vehicle, it's over $500 per mile of range. Um, but what you see about the Tesla Model S, even though it's the most expensive of these electric vehicles, in terms of price per range, uh, it has the lowest, okay, just over th about $300 per mile. So yes, you pay more up front, but you really get what you pay for in the sense that you have a much higher range. And if you basically find out how much it costs, you compare all these electric vehicles, how much does it cost per mile of range? Tesla Model S is actually the uh, least expensive in that category, okay, 